Hi everyone and welcome to the Imagining a New We video blog series with me, Dr. Samantha Cotrera, a video series designed to help history teachers and other history and heritage educators teach history in ways that are more transformative, meaningful, and inclusive for today's students. Uh, today we're going to be talking about historical empathy, which might be a concept that you were, you were introduced to in your Bachelor of Education or maybe your museum studies work, um, that uh, I feel like we don't talk about enough when we get into practice. If you're a fan of The Crown on Netflix, you are particularly going to like this short video because I'm going to use a, a Princess Margaret themed example to help me illustrate the importance of historical empathy, which I'm really excited about and I tried to, to channel her today with a bold red lip and some pearls. I, I have a feeling she would disapprove, but um, I have a feeling she disapproves about a lot of things. So historical empathy, uh, what does that mean for your teaching practice and how does it make uh, history teaching more transformative, inclusive, and meaningful for your students? I really love the notion of creative nonfiction. I love stories, I love narratives, I love being drawn into a particular um, a world and I feel like history can do that and we can often get so bogged down in teaching about like facts on the timeline and important n names and dates that we don't allow ourselves or our students to be able to imagine with these histories and imagine in a way that uh, allows them to see different ways into interpreting or feeling the past not just from our president's point, presentist point of view, but also from the point of view of our experiences, our emotions, and our uh, interpretations of the world around us. This is such an important element of students feeling like they are part of learning history, that they feel that there is a connection to the histories that they are learning, that the histories that they are learning are complex, and that teachers care about them enough to, to foreground these connections and complexities in their class. So when I'm talking about historical empathy, I am drawing on O.L. Davis Jr.'s definition from 2001, where he writes, historical empathy is enriched understanding within context that arises or develops from the active engagement in thinking about particular people, events, and situations in their context, and from a wonderment about reasonable and possible meanings within a time that no one can really know. It is robust, tough, and insightful, even as it is imaginative, and it is always based on available evidence. So there's a couple elements of this definition that I want to really highlight. One is this word wonderment. When's the last time that you learned something or taught something that was based on wonderment? This is such an, an exciting idea that we're allowing students to be able to in, in to the histories, to be able to wonder about the histories, to be able to think about, and again, looking at that definition, reasonable and possible meanings, to wonder about reasonable and possible meanings about history. Now, again, this is not just making stuff up for making stuff up, but it is a form of analysis and a form of interpretation because students aren't just going to take stuff from wherever and just put it together and say, okay, I'm done. But rather, if you go back to the definition, It is always based on available evidence, that students can take evidence that they have, primary source evidence that they have, or secondary interpretations, and, and wonder from that, be able to wonder and explore from that. Now, I've worked with a lot of students that said that they actually like a lot of these historical empathy type things in their class, even when they resist them at first. 
I had one student who said that he was really into war movies, and so being able to write and roll, for example, allowed him to allow his mind to wander and to be able to think about what those soldiers that he watched in war movies and that he was pretending he could be in these letters, what they might say. I did, though, have other students who resisted a, the same type of activity because they said that the teacher didn't really want them to wonder or to explore. They just really wanted them to repeat back what the textbook said, but like in a letter format. Um, you know, that's, that's, not, that's not the wonderment. That's not the type of engagement that students are looking for. When I worked at the Archives of Ontario, we had a very successful exhibit on World War I called Dear Sadie, Love, Lives, and Remembrance from Ontario's First World War. In that exhibit and the lesson plans and um, workshops that we ran from that, we asked students to look at letters between Sadie Arbuckle, a woman in Toronto, and uh, Harry Mason, her boyfriend who was overseas fighting World War I. and to be able to think about uh, what went on behind the scenes of the letters that they wrote. And I had one student that was like, Miss, it's so funny because Harry's like, I love you, Sadie. And Sadie's like, dude, stop calling me. Stop texting me. And I mean, of course he's wrong. Harry was not calling and texting Sadie, but it was this wonderment of what this situation might look like for his own life that allowed him to make these meaningful connections in a ways that perhaps made the learning of World War I a little bit more transformative for him. So this notion of wonderment, of being based in the evidence, of insightful, of thinking about historical empathy, creative nonfiction, even fiction, as a way for students to analyze and interpret history can be something that is a little bit more meaningful for students in their learning of history. Now, if you are a fan of The Crown, you might like this example. I, um, when I first started watching season one and two of The Crown, um, I looked up Princess Margaret, as we all did, because of that, that wonderful portrayal of Princess Margaret. And I found that this book that was just coming out, and it's called 99 Glimpses of Princess Margaret, Madam Darling by Craig Brown. What Craig Brown did, there we go, can we see it? A little less glare. What Craig Brown did was he took bits and pieces of a whole bunch of different news articles written about Princess Margaret during the time, and he organized them and he put them together in these small chapters and interpreted a history around that that is a creative nonfiction piece of work that is based on these original primary sources from the time period. But they are newspaper articles, right? So they aren't even like this accurate description as if we can ever get an accurate description. This is B. If uh, you've seen other videos, you know she has a sister, Betty, who also likes to jump on the desk. Um, uh, the, sorry. So Craig Brown takes all of these different um, these different news articles that are primary sources because they're from the time, but they're still secondary interpretations of what was happening, and he he interpreted them in these robust, tough, insightful, based on evidence ways that that allowed for a wonderment of what was going on, perhaps behind the scenes or in people's heads. Um, the shaking of the screen is still be. Uh, what was going on behind the scenes or what other things were happening to be able to to identify that there are 99 different ways that we can think through who Princess Margaret was in the public and in her family and to herself. So this is a really great example. I'd recommend the book. I mean, it's a little, it's a little long, but there are excerpts that you can read online as an example of ways to bring in a set of primary sources and get your students to be able to insightfully, with wonderment, interpret them using historical empathy. And so that's our little video for today. Talk, students talking about historical empathy can be found in my new book, Transforming the Canadian History Classroom, Imagining a New We, that sadly doesn't have any Princess Margaret or any other drunken royals uh, in it, but 
but uh, I'm sure you'll forgive me for that. And in that book, I talk more about students' interest in uh, historical empathy in the classroom, and I connect it to Joseph Novak's notion that meaningful learning is the constructive integration of thinking, feeling, and acting, leading for empowerment, for commitment and responsibility. The words are right there. Please let me know if you've tried um, something like this in your classroom, if you're going to try, and if you need some more support in bringing these ideas into your classroom. I'd love to help you work through that, and I'll talk to you next week. Have a great week, everyone.